Be diligent to rightly divide, and his word will never fail. Well, that's a fact, isn't it? On the radio program today, some, some fellow called in and said, well, all that rightly dividing business. You guys just need to get out of a King James Bible and go to some of these modern Bibles that don't say that. Now, if I was him, I wouldn't mind saying that. I don't blame him for saying that. Uh, he said, I didn't want the Bible, you, you know, that's interesting. And I made the comment, and the man stopped me, and that's, that's real frustrating. I made the comment, that's not true. And, of course, then it was, be quiet, it isn't your turn to talk. And by the time it was, we have gone on to something else. But uh, <laughs> kind of a frust. You do the best you can in a situation like that, and the best you're going to be able to do is not going to be too good. But uh, anyway, that, that expression, rightly dividing the word of truth in the modern Bibles, is, is completely thrown out, and it says uh, rightly handling the word of God. And uh, that isn't what the Greek text says. You go check it. Get your, you know, all you got to have to do is a strong concordance. Look it up. The word is orthotomeno. Ortho, ortho, you see them braces? They don't only catch food. They come from an orthodontist. You know what that is? Ortho. They call that ortho work. Now, that isn't what they put them in there originally for. They, they, they lied to me when they got them in there. And after they got them, they started tightening them. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, ortho work, straightening. That's what the word is. We use orth, orthodontry. We use uh, orthodontics, orthopedics. After we were on the radio today, there was a foot doctor showed up. <laughs> Orthopedist. And uh, they're going to have a foot doctor on there, you know. And, uh, well, I tell you, the, the way you step on toes around that place, is, it's no wonder they had a foot doctor coming. But I was, I was sitting in the technician's lap. And a uh, poor guy, he was doing, he was, they, they were doing great. That, that, great people at that station, real fine people. I'm real impressed with the... Uh, with Al and the, the wisdom that he had to, to handle things and keep it on an even keel. Mike is engineer, and I, I literally was sitting in his lap and uh, trying to run the program and hold notes up and make things work, you know. And you don't have any idea when you hear what, what you know, it sounds calm and collected. And, man, it is absolute bedlam. It's worse than a hurricane. And it, it's confusion. People running here or there and handing things, all the stuff. You're reading one thing... So, you're reading one thing, saying something else, and trying to figure out what to do. You know, you're reading two different things, trying to figure out which one to do, and the guy's saying, he's talking while he's saying one thing, reading two other things, trying to figure out which to go next to next. Now, if you don't think that can get confusing, and that's where they live. I mean, that's their lifestyle. But anyway, ortho is straight. Timno, orthotomeo, ortho, timno, you put the, the verb timno means to cut. The word means to cut a thing straight, make a straight cut. You know what you do when you make a straight cut? You rightly cut thing, you rightly separate it, you rightly divide it. Where the, where the, the, uh, the idea of properly handling, correctly handling came from, it comes from the Latin Vulgate. It's their translation, their interpretation of what that phrase is supposed to mean. You check it out. I've checked it out. And uh, that's, where, that's where that translation comes from. It comes from translators and commentators that don't understand what rightly dividing is all about to start with. And because they don't understand what Paul is saying, therefore they jettison what the Bible says and come up with all... They try to interpret it rather than just literally translate it out there. And that's where that comes from. That, 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 express, that, that chorus there that... Uh, our brother, you wrote that, didn't you? The, the, the words to that and the song, the melody... Be diligent to write the divide, and his word will never fail. That's the whole key. You know that? Not too long ago, there was a man who wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture is Going to Come in 1988. His book failed. Before the year was out, 1988 was out, he had sent out another book and said, Why I missed it by one year. And he said, Now nah, it's going to be in September 1989. I told you last night, I was in a Bible conference in Buffalo, New York in 1988, September the 11th. Was, it was the 9th, 10th, and 11th, and the Sunday afternoon of the 11th, the lady came to me and said, if you read this book, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture is Going to Come, either September 11th, 12th, or 13th. I said, no, ma'am, I hadn't seen that. And she says, well, well, here, read it quick. <laughs> and I read it on the way on, on the plane going home, and I thought, well, I don't have anything to worry about. Because this man has taken one passage of Scripture from the prophetic program and has completely misunderstood it. And because he misunderstood it, he's built a whole system trying to date the rapture on something he missed. His pre uh, uh, premise, the proposition was all wrong. And because of that, all of this system that he built up. Now he wrote the book and he says, well, 10,000 people got saved because of that. I don't know. I don't know if you know who Ed is, but uh, got out of a 
down in Florida, and I've read what he says you got to do to get saved. And if you believe what he tells you to do to get saved, you're not going to get saved. So I don't know if 10,000 people got saved or not. If they did, thank God. But I don't thank God that a man would put out some information like that and bring the teaching ministry of the Word of God into absolute reproach. By the way, commercial. On the table back there are some tapes. I don't, I'd like to not... 88 reasons. Oh, let's forget about that. 89 came again. More reasons about, you know, I, I got the calendar. And all of that stuff has to do with a failure to rightly divide the word of truth. The reason, bottom line, for all of the date setting, for all of the attempts to identify when the rapture is going to come by this event and this event and this event, all of them have one basic flaw. And that is a failure to recognize the distinctive, the absolute, completely distinctive ministry of the Apostle Paul. Without the Apostle Paul in your Bible, you would never even assume there was going to be a pre-tribulation rapture. Without Paul, you'll, you know absolutely nothing about escaping and, and being delivered from the wrath to come. You don't have that, that kind of a ministry in your Bible. Listen, folks. The issue of the pre-trib is a distinctively Pauline truth. With Paul, you understand it. But what Paul holds the rapture out is that it can take place at any moment. Christ's advent back to the earth, the tribulation period that precedes it, can't take place at any moment. At any moment in time, the second advent of Jesus Christ back to this earth in flaming fire to take vengeance on them that know not God to come with His holy angels and, and sit upon the throne of His glory. At any moment in time, right now, it is at least, it is more than seven years away from tonight. It is absolutely biblically, scripturally, verse with verse, impossible for Jesus Christ to return to this planet and set up His kingdom in the next seven years. It'll take more than seven years because the 70th week of Daniel chapter 9 has to transpire before he comes back. And there are some things, we're going to see them tonight, in prophecy that have to take place before the 70th week of Daniel begins. That are going to take more than the seven years that the 70th week take place. Now, there's a passage of Scripture that I tell you to find in it. Okay, that's going to cut through about half my notes right there. I don't have any notes. That's the problem. Somebody said, you know, somebody said, how many points did he have? And somebody told him one time, said, you don't have any points. <laughs> no point to your message. <laughs> well, I got a point tonight. Matthew chapter number 24. There's a passage of Scripture here that is commonly used to identify. I want, I want to say something to you. There are no signs to signal the coming of the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. Now, you understand what we mean by the rapture. Uh, Jesus Christ died at Calvary, ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit came back on the apostles. Uh, in the book of Acts, the fall of Israel takes place. The church, the body of Christ, is in here like this. You can all see that pretty well. Stretch your neck down in the front row down there. <laughs> okay? Okay. Um, the body of Christ comes in here. One day, Jesus Christ is going to come back in, in, into the heavens and catch the church, the body of Christ, up to meet Him in the air. And we'll face the judgment seat of Christ, and then we'll go back into the heavenly places to be with Him and be presented to God the Father. This event right here, the catching up of the church, the body of Christ, in the Bible is called what? The day of redemption. It is not called the day of Christ, by the way. There isn't one verse in your Bible that calls the rapture the day of Christ. You know who calls it the day of Christ? Schofield. <laughs> but not the Bible. Now you need to remember that. Because when you study Second Thessalonians chapter number 2, and he talks about the day of Christ over there, and you try to, you think, well, he said, don't let any man deceive you, as of the rapture. He didn't talk about the rapture. The rapture isn't called the day of Christ in your Bible. It's not called the day of Christ in anybody's Bible. The rapture is called the day of redemption. Okay? By the way, you go home and take your concordance and look up the times Paul talks about the day of Christ. You know what he called it? He called it the day of Christ, the day of Jesus Christ, the day of the Lord Jesus, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't just call it the day of Christ. That's what the preachers call it. You know why the preachers can't understand 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2? Because they don't talk, talk like Paul talked. I'm not whistling Dixie at you.
I know it, but I'm not whistling it. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I'm not just barking up a tree. Hey, folks, there's, there's some things about... When you study that Bible, you better take what that book says and study what it says. And let the words on the page be the thing that make the difference to you. And the day of Christ is a real interesting thing, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. That's some one of other misunderstood subjects. This is the day of redemption. Christ catches the body of Christ away. We call that the rapture. Now somebody says, that's not a Bible word. I know it's not, but I don't know what else you're going to call it. Call it the blessed hope. Great. Call it the catching away. Great. But how are you going to feel when you go? You're going to feel a little, you're going to feel upbeat, aren't you? When you're caught up? Rapture. I don't have any problem. I know people that say, well, the Latin words, and I get all better. It's okay with me if you want to call it the rapture, if you want to call it the blessed hope, if you want to call it the catching up. I don't care what you call it. Just know it's the day of redemption, and that's that. Then after that, you're going to go back into time past back here, the basic distinction back there between the circumcision and the uncircumcision, fall of Israel, body of Christ in here, dispensation of the grace of God in here like this. Then... Books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John fit in time past. Book of Acts, you have the fall of Israel. Romans through Philemon, you have the dispensation of grace where we are here. Hebrews through Revelation, you have the ages to come out over here. After the rapture, did you set this one out? Okay, I thought that was the one I used last night that didn't work. Hey, look at there. The blue one. After the rapture, you're going to go back. This is the... But now, where we are now, over here you have the ages to come. And when you get over there, you're going to go back into the prophetic program, and that which God promised these people back here is going to be brought to a, a fulfillment over in here. One of the things they're going to have to face is the wrath of God against their, against their idolatry and their sin. Then Christ is going to come back to the planet. He's going to set up His kingdom over here and say, bind Satan in the bottomless pit. He's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. Then the great white throne and the dispensation of the fullness of time will take place. There's 7,000 years from Adam to right there. 6,000 to there. 7,000 to seventh day of rest. The dispensation of the fullness of time. A dispensation in which time is brought to its fulfillment and the purpose of time is arrived at is a 33,000 year period that extends on out after that and then you go out after that into eternity. Now, the tribulation in here, what we call the tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel is a seven year period of time right there. Get the terminology in your mind. The rapture, taking away of the church, the body of Christ. Then you take up prophecy again. This is... The mystery program in here. This is the prophecy program. This is the program back over here. Here's prophecy. This is the program in here which has been spoken about, talked about, preached about, and made known since the foundation of the world. Here's a program in here that was kept secret since the world began. Here over here he says, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This is something God Almighty prepared from before the foundation of the world. Kept it secret till He made it known through Paul and to us. These two things are different. You know how I know they're different? Words on a page on a Bible tell me they're different. One says it's made known since the foundation of the world. The other says it's kept secret since the world began. Hey folks, I ain't real smart. But I got sense enough to get a hold of that. If you can see that something was made known since the world began, and something was kept secret since the world began, you can understand they're different. I was out in Las Vegas, Nevada. I was on a spiritual mission. I was visiting with, with one of the greatest ladies you'd ever, if you ever go out there, and God only knows why you'd go out there, because I don't. It's out in the middle of the most forsaken desert I ever, whoever they stole Utah from, they could give it back and we'd be ahead. It is the most, oh, it's awful, desert. And you drive up on this sin city, you know. I was there the week after the Southern Baptists were there. That's right, I picked a great week. And, and I, I was driving to California with my oldest boy. And we, we, we made Las Vegas and we spent the night. And I went the next day to meet Rena Jaquith. Rena and her husband Clifford were missionaries in, in Morocco. He died over there. They were there 13 years in, in, in North Africa. And before that, they were in Israel. And you've met Dove Avnon and, and Doran Zakai. And it's through their ministry.
young men came to know the Lord, and people, in, people all over the world came to know the Lord through their ministry. And I was talking to Mrs. Jaquith, and she's 78 years old, and boy, she's a, she is a handful. Man, you talk about a go-getter. And I mean, she's on the street corner passing. Tra- I, when we went into her place there, a storefront she has there, and it's a ministry, there were three people sitting in there studying the Bible then. And she sees people get saved on a daily basis and gets them in the Word rightly divided and gets them established. And then and there, and as soon as somebody gets on their feet, they leave town. If you're on your feet, you leave the place. You don't go to it. Okay? I said, Reno, tell me, how would you come see the grace message? She said, open your Bible to Acts 3 and Romans 16. <laughs> yes, ma'am. She said, I, she said, 10 years I was a Pentecostal preacher. Ten years, I was a tongues talker. I was a healer. She said, I healed everybody that came into my place. In fact, I even healed my cat. <laughs> She's dead serious now. She said, one day, I got sick. And I couldn't get well. And I went to the doctor and they said, you're going to have to go to the hospital. And she said, I couldn't go to the hospital where I was. It would be a discouragement to the saints. So I, I went off into a far city and went to the hospital there, but it was a discouragement to me. You can, leave, you can leave the saints behind, but you can't leave you behind. She said, I got over there and I kept saying, Lord, what's the matter? What's wrong? She said, one day I was sitting on, my, on the chair beside my bed reading my Bible. And she said, all, she said and, and this, this one was a Bible student. She's not just out running around. And she said, I, I was reading Acts chapter 3, and I read where Peter says that, 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 that these things have been spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And she said, you know, I said, there's a verse like that in Romans 16. And she said, I went over and I found Romans 16, 25, and I compared it with Acts 3, 21, and they weren't the same. Acts 3.21 says, These things which Peter was doing were spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Romans 16.25 says, The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made. And she said, Thank you, Lord, that's beautiful. The lady in the bed next door, she said, Well, what's so pretty in that ceiling? <laughs> she said, No, no, something in this Bible. And she said, From that day till this, I've had it didn't take me 15 years to get the thing figured out. I saw it. And you know something I can tell you? If it wouldn't take someone like her 15 years to get it figured out, but just those two verses, you know what I know about you and me? It ought not take us any longer than that either. And if it does, it isn't because it isn't plain in the Word of God. There's something in us don't want it. Oh, me. But that's right. Now, you understand the difference between this and that, if you will. The rapture, body of Christ, we go out. Tribulation starts here. Seventh week, then the advent of Christ back to the earth and the kingdom. So when we talk about the second advent back to the earth, we're talking about that. We call that the revelation of Christ. We call this the rapture. We call that, we use those titles by accommodation. Okay? We talk about Genesis to Malachi, we call it the Old Testament. I know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in, the New, are in the Old Testament economy, but we call it the Old Testament and the New Testament by way of accommodation. The guy on the radio today, he says, My brother Jordan, you're a hyper-dispensationalist, right? An ultra-dispensationalist, right? I said, well, no, not really. He says, oh, you don't call yourself. I said, no, I said, you know, that's what my enemies call me. <laughs> that's a little pejorative. I don't call them. He said, well, then... What do you call yourself? And I couldn't even think of it. I said, for supper? I, you, know, you know. Then at dawn, you know, I said, well, maybe, maybe, you know, mid-act. So, so I come up with a title. He liked that, you know. So we, we got along. But I don't care what you call this. Well, you make, it, make yourself happy about it. But I'm going to use the terms in that accommodating sense. Okay? Rapture here. Revelation here. I want you to be sure you understand that because I want you to understand what we're talking about. When it comes to the rapture of the church, the body of Christ, this event right here, there are absolutely no N-O signs to tell you when that thing's going to show up. It could show up tonight.
It might not be for another 150, 200, 300, 500 years. I don't know. And I tell you something else, you don't know. And there isn't a way you can look around at circumstances out there and figure it out. There isn't a way in the world. You say, things are getting worse and worse. They've always been getting worse and worse. and more people on the earth today than they ever have been. Well, you think you're going to get better? <laughs> Only way I know to make the world better is kill off all the people. Because we're the problem. Creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, because of our sin. And I'm not advocating going killing off everybody. I'm just saying that's the only way it's going to happen. And hey, folks, we hadn't had a good war in 40 or 50 years, so this will be going to have to one come sooner or later. Economics tell you that. And I've got three children, and I'm not promoting it, okay? When my kids get grown, I'll have grandkids, and I still won't be promoting it. I'm just saying I understand what reality is like. The rapture isn't any way to date it. I'm going to show you. I want to show you some things here about it. This thing over here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are all kinds of ways of knowing that. When this seventieth week begins right here, folks, Daniel 11 says, "They that have wisdom shall instruct many. They're going to understand. They can begin to count the days, buddy, and they can stand and watch him come on the day it says it." But you can't do that over here. You know what Jesus Christ told those people over there? He said, when you see these things, and he names them off over there, begin to take place, look up, because your redemption draws nigh, but you don't need to look up till then. If you don't see those things happening, forget looking up. But when you see them, start looking, because now it's fixing to take place. Now, you say, if all that's true, preacher, what about, you know, you know what everybody asks you about? There aren't any signs to tell you when the rapture is going to take place. So everybody says, yeah, but what about 1948? That was Ed's problem. He got all hung up on 1948. Back in 1981, everybody was, rapture's got to come. Why? Well, Israel became a nation in 1948. So you add a generation, 40 years, that's 1988. And you subtract seven years for the tribulation, the, the, the seventh week, that's 1981. That's pretty good reasoning, isn't it? Sounded good to me. 1981, it's got to be here. Was he here? Nope. Didn't come. So everybody says, well, we got to figure it another way. And so they, they say, well, maybe this number's wrong. Maybe that number's But you know what the problem with that is? That thing right there. The assumption's wrong. The assumption's wrong. Whoever told you that the founding of the nation Israel had anything to do with anything anyway? How Lindsay did, didn't he? Matthew chapter 24. Verse number 31. Verse number 32. Matthew 24, 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near. What's near? The second coming of Christ is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things shall uh, all these things be fulfilled. Hey, that passage isn't hard to get. Look at here. Learn a parable of the fig tree. Here's the fig tree. What's that? What's fig tree type of in the Bible? Israel. Parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, when it begins to bud forth, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, when you see the fig tree begin to bud, know that it, the second coming, is near. When you see the fig tree begin to bud, know that that thing right there is near. This generation, that's where they got the 40 years. This generation that sees the fig tree bud shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Amen, glory, let's go home. We got it, right? Problem is, it didn't happen, did it? You know what the problem with that is? That's a basic misunderstanding of what that passage is all about. Now, there are two problems. Number one, it's a failure to understand that what Christ prophesies back here in Matthew hadn't got anything to do with that. It skips over it and it looks toward that. So he wasn't talking about you to start with. It didn't have anything to do with, uh, with you. You know how I know that? Turn to Matthew chapter number 10. Lady called up on the radio today. You know, she started calling out. Uh, she read us about two pages out of John MacArthur's.
I started this, and I didn't say it. Leon's right. I didn't say it. I started to say, well, John's book's good, but how about let's read in God's book? And I thought about that, but I didn't say it. See, I held it back. <laughs> I kept it back. But uh, the guy I was on there with, he almost didn't. He got upset, man. He told that John MacArthur didn't write that book. I talked to the guy that wrote that book. Boy, he went after her, you know. I thought, Glory, man, you get her. I'll, I'll stay out of this. <laughs> Matthew 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and in any city of the Samaritans enter you not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, Did he send them to preach to Gentiles? Matthew chapter number 15. Matthew chapter number 15, verse number 24. Jesus says to his disciples, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You know how I know Matthew 24 doesn't have anything to do with the dispensation of the grace of God and the right to the church of the body of Christ and you people sitting in here tonight because he didn't talk to you back then. You know why you can't take the book of Matthew and get instructions that are going to work in your life? Why the prayer promises in Matthew 21, 22 don't work in your life even when you make out like they do? you got all these theological gimmicks to try to make those things work and you know they don't work. That's why you got all them gimmicks. And the reason they don't is God never gave you any instructions back there. Jesus Christ gave you plenty to do. Hey, if you want to do what He wants you to do, there's plenty to do in Romans to Philemon. You'll be tired and poor and old and, and never get them all done. If you don't believe that, take the book of Romans and just try it. Take Rome, I, I dare you. Take Romans chapter 12. And just see how long it'd take you to do everything in that chapter. Habitually. Don't do it perfectly, just do it consistently. Just do it consistently. You, why, it'll take you about 15 years to get about 8 verses down into that chapter. And it's got 21 in it. So you've got, I mean, there's plenty to do. It isn't that you're being left high and dry, you know. Somebody says, oh, you guys throw out everything west of Romans. I mean, look, people, this isn't a common, this, this, this is a serious issue. Let's find out what God's doing. It's important. You've got plenty in there to do, so don't worry. Nobody's stealing anything from you. And listen, I dare any man stand up and look at me and tell me I'm a Bible chopper. I take it in the neck for the integrity of that book right there from one end to the other. And I do it gladly. You can say what you want to. I don't care. I'll take it. And I'll take it like a man in grace. I'm not going to whimper about it. I don't mind being in the battle. So don't come along telling me that I'm tearing up pages and throwing out pages in that book, not when I go after and am going after for going after people that really do. had not got anything to do with chopping up the Bible. You know what it has to do with? It has to do with understanding the book God gave us. There's our... What he's doing back there doesn't have anything to do with this. It wasn't in view. It was a secret nobody back there knew about. God, Jesus Christ, in his own self, determined not to tell anybody about it. Now, you make out like he didn't know what he was doing or didn't do what he said he was going to do, but I'm going to believe him. I'm not going to believe John MacArthur. I believe God's book. Now, that's different. Matthew, he's looking at this thing over here. So the first thing that people misunderstand is they go to Matthew 24 and try to find this stuff and you can't do it because it ain't there. So forget about it. It ain't going to work. Now you say, but well then what do I do with Matthew? Study it in light of what it is. I've got 70 hours of teaching verse by verse through the book of Matthew. If you want to understand Matthew, I bet I know as much about the book of Matthew as you do. I bet you. I bet I know more about the book of Mark than you do. You say, you're being smart. I look, I sure am. Doing it on purpose. I'm doing it trying to make a point to you. What do you do? You study it in the light of what it is, where it is, as it is. Take what God said as being what God meant and let it fit where it fits. And you begin to lose some of those problems. But beside that, Matthew 24, when you take Matthew chapter 24, the key to understanding it is to understand that the prophetic outline set forth in Matthew 24.
and, and that of the whole uh, of our Lord's earthly ministry has to do with, with, with this Jewish time schedule and uh, prophetic events in the ages to come. But my friend, the issue of the budding fig tree, aside from that, it, it's fascinating because the budding fig tree doesn't have anything to do with 1948 anyway. And that's the key. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. Come with me to Judges chapter number 9. There are four trees in your Bible that represent the nation Israel. Four of them. Anybody know what they are? One of them's a fig tree. You got that. One of them is an olive tree. Romans 11. One of them is a vine. One of them is a brown one. Four trees. All four of those trees were in the Garden of were, were, were in Eden. Genesis 2 and 3. God uses those trees as representatives of, uh, uh, of different things. When the nation Israel comes along, He uses them as representatives of different aspects of the life of the nation Israel. Uh, of Israel. The fig tree rep is, represents Israel, but Israel in a very special viewpoint. The vine tree represents Israel in a special aspect of Israel. The olive tree represents a very special truth about Israel. The bramble represents a special truth about Israel. They all represent Israel, but they represent different things about Israel. I'm a daddy. I'm a husband. I'm a preacher. I'm an American. I'm a Chicago an Illinoisan, whatever that is, an Illini. I ain't a Cubs fan. <laughs> I want to get that over with. See, I'm me, but there's a lot of different capacities about me. A lot of different ways of viewing me. Some good, some not so good. Okay? Same with Israel. And those four trees represent the purpose and the program and the things that God's accomplishing and dealing with that nation and different aspects of that nation. It's important to grasp that. Now, there are two of them that are important to us. The olive and the, the bramble don't figure in Matthew 24. But the, the fig tree does because it's the parable of the fig tree. And the vine tree does. Most people, Schofield, Larkin, Bullinger, Lindsay, Ed, whatever his name was, Wisenot, Wizard, or whatever his name was. I don't know who he was. I, I can't remember his name. They all say the fig tree represents Israel as a nation. You got the fig tree, the vine, the olive, and the bramble. And they say that the fig tree represents Israel as a nation. And that's why they picked 1948. For when you see the fig tree put forth its you, when you see the nation begin to sprout itself, that's the generation that sees that's going to see the Lord come. Problem is, come with me to Psalm chapter 80. Psalm 80. Now, we didn't look at Judges 9 there, and, and I'm, on, I'm not going to go over it because of time, but if you read down through verse 7 through verse 14, you'll see those four trees there in Jotham's parable you'll see the, uh, the four trees that are involved in Israel's history there, and you'll see that they have a specific aspect in relation to the life and history of the nation Israel. And I want to, I want to get through here before it gets to be too late. We want to focus on the fig tree and the vine tree. Now, the standard interpretation of Matthew 24 is that the fig tree represents the national life, Israel as a nation. Hence, when the nation is put back in the land... We went over to Jack Van Impey's place today. Man, does he have a posh set up over there. That is, the pastor and I came out of there green with envy and covered with covetousness. <laughs> I tell you what, man, I could wreck that place in about a week, man. I can't keep anything neat like that. It just sparkles. It's beautiful. I've heard Dr. Van Impey talk about Israel going in the land. There's the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And we're going, you know something, folks? That's a misunderstanding. As far as pr the prophetic program in our day goes, that's probably one of the most misunderstood things with regard to the coming of the 
Christ there is. That's the basic passage for all the date setting. And they're dead wrong. First, because it hadn't got anything to do with us. But even if you took that aside, it doesn't have anything to do with what they say it has anything to do with because they've misunderstood what the fig tree is. Psalm 80. Verse number 8. Get Psalm 80 in one hand and Isaiah chapter 5 in one hand. Psalm 80 and Isaiah 5. Psalm 80, verse number 8. Thou, talking about verse number 1, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. Thou, the shepherd of Israel, hast brought a what? A vine out of where? Egypt. Who'd God bring out of Egypt? He brought the nation Israel out of, out of Egypt, didn't He? Do you know what the birthday of the nation Israel was? It was the exodus out of Egypt. You know what the birthday of our land is, don't you? July 4th, 19, oh, 19, 1776, whenever it was. <laughs> we were, we had, there were people here, but we, 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 we gave birth to our nation. The birth of the nation Israel was the exodus out of Egypt. Verse 8 says, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou preparest room before it and didst cause it to take deep root and it filled the land. And on and on he goes to describe how he, he cast out the, 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 the heathen and how, how he took that vine and, and planted it in Palestine and how it spread across the country from Jordan all the way to the, to the Mediterranean. Folks, it's clear. If Psalm 80 means anything, that the vine that he planted in Palestine is the nation. Then in the Bible, what does the vine represent? Say it loud. The national life of Israel. So if I'm looking for something to represent Israel as a nation, what tree do I look for? The fig tree? No, the vine tree. So if I'm looking for something to represent 1948, I'd look for the vine, not the fig. You get that? I said chapter 5, in case you didn't. Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard, his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. Verse number 7, he talks, verse 1, 2 to 5, 7, he talks about planting it in Palestine. Verse 7, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah his pleasure. Listen, folks, the nation, four trees. The fig tree, the vine tree, the olive tree, the bramble. The bramble represents Israel and idolatry and apostasy under the Antichrist. The olive tree represents the access to God that's available through the nation Israel. When Solomon built that temple, you remember what he made the doors out of that went into the Holy of Holies? He made the doors... He made everything else out of some other kind of wood, but he made the doors and the posts that the doors hang, hung on, on out of olive trees. You know why? Because it represents access to God available through that nation. The vine tree. You know what it represents? It represents Israel as a nation. Planted in the land of Palestine and growing. Now, I got a pro I don't have a problem with that. So far, so good, right? Problem is, Matthew 24 is a parable of the what kind of tree? So we can just kick out 1948. It hasn't got anything to do with it. That fig tree over there hadn't got anything to do with the restoration of the nation Israel or of Israel as a nation. It's got something to do with Israel because all those trees represent Israel, but the vine tree, the, the fig tree does not represent Israel as a nation. How do I know? Because that's what the vine tree does. Well, you say now, preacher, what about the fig tree? Well, that's not that hard. Go back to Genesis chapter 3.
Do you remember the first time a fig tree shows up in the Bible? Genesis chapter 3, verse number 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves. They made themselves little britches out of fig leaves. And that was when fig tree religion was begun. That's the beginning of religion right there. Human effort. Man's feeble attempt to cover himself before a holy God. And you know what he did? He reached up and took a leaf off a tree. The olive tree was available. You can take that. He'd already took something off the, the vine tree that he shouldn't have. Cedars were available. Pines were available. You know, oak trees were available. You know what he took? Fig leaves. You know what figs? You know what fig trees? What a fig represents? It represents religion. It represents self righteousness. It represents man's attempt to bind himself back. You know what it is? It's it's the religious life. It represents Israel's religion. Come with me to Matthew chapter twenty-one. Let me show you something. If that isn't the way this thing works out. You got a problem, brother. Matthew 21. We were over there today at that, that radio station. That brother from Texas, Tom, dear guy, nice guy, gentleman. I talked to him later and hope to get to know him, get a chance to talk with him about some of the things we tried to discuss and didn't really have much opportunity to do between us. When they opened up the phone lines, it wasn't me and him, me against him and him against me. It was us against them. Because everybody out there in the listening audience, they're anti-dispensational. And every telephone call that, that came into there was opposed to both of us, not just me. Did you notice that? They were, you know what the church out there, 97.9% .9 of the church out there is anti-dispensational. Tom, Tom was on that station. They, they tried to get a professor at Dallas Seminary on. And he had a class this afternoon and couldn't come on. So he recommended Tom Ice to them because he and Tom have co-authored a book about dominion theology. That's how Tom got to be on there today. Tom told me on the telephone after we talked, he said, you know, if some of the professors from Dallas Seminary had been on, they'd have been in real agreement with you and in much sympathy with the callers. And I said, how would that be? He said, because Dallas is so weak now just about being dispensationalist. Forget being Acts 2, just dispensational at all. You know, that is the school in America that's always stood head and shoulders for dispensationalism against covenant theology and amillennialism, post-millennialism. And you know what the man down there that knows the people, I don't know him, he knows them, talks to them, sees them. You know what he said? He said, they're weak, they're about gone. Only a few of them. And the ones that are strong, they've kind of gotten out the door. You know what that means, folks? That means what we're doing here is, is real different. What we're doing in here, well, you're a bunch of oddballs. Of course, you knew that to start with, but that's the, that's the view. Being a dispensationalist in 1989 is not front and center. Everybody talks about, oh, how? No, no, no. You know what you're going to be? You're going to be a peculiar people. Zealous of good works, I hope, but peculiar nonetheless. It's not a common thing. It's not the, the view that the church at large takes today. There's the great masses of the covenant reform group and the amillennial people out here. There's the great masses of the care. They call themselves... That's the, that's the view. Being a dispensationalist in 1989 is not front and center, everybody talk about, oh, how, no, no, no. You know what you're going to be? You're going to be a peculiar people, zealous of good works, I hope, but peculiar nonetheless. It's not a common thing. It's not the, the view that the church at large takes today. There's the great masses of the covenant reform group and the amillennial people out here. There's the great masses of the care. They call themselves reconstructionists. There's the great masses of the charismatic movement. They call themselves kingdom nouns. 
and they all teach what's called dominion theology, which is just warmed over post-millennialism. Amillennialism, people, is a post-millennialist without a post to lean on. It's all the same thing. And you know what the only answer to it is? Rightly dividing the word. Fascinating. Everybody that called. Tom and I were all of a sudden agreeing against all of them because that's the, that's the condition. You, go, you know the only place you're going to get light and understanding on that book is rightly dividing it. All that other myth, Pastor Watkins, I've heard him talk about trying to butt them things together that don't butt together. You know what you have? You go ask him after, after the meeting what, what you have in your ministry. You have confusion. You have disappointment. It all just comes apart and unravels and it don't work. And I don't care how much you scream and holler to the contrary, it isn't going to work because you aren't going to make God do something God isn't going to do. Matthew 21. If that thing I just did on that board isn't right, those people that called today were right and I was wrong. And I want you to know that. A lady called up and read MacArthur's book and she says, if what those guys are saying, we're preaching a false gospel. You're right, brother. If what if what you're saying is right, I'm preaching a heresy. And that's a fact. If the gospel that saves a man today is the gospel that was preached in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, brother, I don't preach it. I'm not going to tell you to get saved today by what must a good master, what must I do to have eternal life, keep the commandments. You're not going to get that from me. You know what you're going to get from me? You can't keep the law, quit keeping the law, quit trying to keep the law, and just have faith alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So I say that on the radio. Some guy comes on there and says, Yeah, but we all got to work. James chapter 2. You know what the problem with that is? Absolute confusion. Trying to put grace and works together. And you know what happens when you do that? God takes His grace out. You don't have to worry about what you did to it. God will take care of it. He'll take His grace out. He's a jealous God, folks. He says, it's not of Him that willeth or runneth, but it's of God. He's the one sets the standard. He's the one who tells you what happens, not you Him. He tells you how He'll take you, not, not you telling Him how you'll come. And I'll tell you something, if that right there isn't true, if this thing right here about this fig tree being the religion, the vine being the nation, isn't true, then you can just walk out of here and forget anything I've told you. Because they're right. I'm going to show you that. Matthew 21. Verse 17. He left them, went out of the city into Bethany, and lodged there. And now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. When he saw the fig tree in the way, he came to and found no th nothing thereon, but leaves only. And said unto it, Let no fruit grow on therefore uh, henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away, and his disciples saw it, and they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Now people, you know, they try to excuse the Lord for cursing the fig tree and making it wither, and they say, Well, it had leaves, but it didn't have any fruit. And fig trees, somebody, I, I've read this all my life, now, I don't know if it's true or not. But they say that in Palestine, the fig trees have figs on them before they have leaves. Now, I'm going to tell you something. My mom in her backyard down in Mobile all my life had three big old fig trees. She used to can eight, ten gallons of figs every year off them figs. I love figs, preserves. Man, I tell you, that, that's how I got this way. <laughs> I just get this way eating, eat, eating nothing. I never saw a fig tree in my life had figs on it before it had leaves on it. Now, maybe they got some different kind of breed of them over there. I don't know. But that isn't the point in this passage. That fig tree had leaves. It didn't have any fruit. And Christ cursed it. It made a profession, but it didn't have the fruit to go with it. Christ came looking for fruit. I'm hungry, looking for fruit. And there wasn't any in Israel. But do you see what it says when the he, he cursed, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth? What's the next word? Forever. If that fig tree represents the nation, you know what Jesus Christ said? He said, fruit can't fr come from that nation forever. He cursed the nation forever. 
then the nation of Israel's gone. God's through with them. All them dudes out there are right, and we might as well just go be part of them because it sure makes their life a lot easier. And it makes the ministry more prosperous. I guarantee you, I could get a big church. I know how to do it. Problem is, they ain't right. That fig tree isn't the nation. And God isn't through with Israel. And if Romans 11 says anything, it says that. God isn't through with Israel. The fig tree isn't the nation. The fig tree is the religion. And hey, folks, what did God say about the religion? God Almighty never gave but one religion in all of human history, and He gave it to Israel through the hands of Moses. And you know what God did with that? You know what that Mosaic Covenant did? They never brought forth any fruit under that Mosaic Covenant that blessed God, that pleased God. And God Almighty said, I'm going to have, that thing's cursed. It won't do because you're the problem. And all that comes with that is a curse. And so God Almighty sets that thing aside and He says, I'm going to have to give you a what? A new covenant. I'm going to have to come and do for you, Israel, what you couldn't do for yourself. And so He sends a, re he sends a Redeemer back on the basis of a new covenant, sets up that new covenant, and through the blessings of that new covenant, gives them what He promised. What I'm saying to you people is that Matthew 24 has absolutely nothing to do with this. It has absolutely nothing to do with, with what these people do over here with it. They don't even understand. You know what He's saying? He said, when you see that fig tree bud, you'll know that those things over there are coming. That 70th week of Daniel is divided into two sections. There's 1,260 days on one side, 1,260 days on the other side. 220 After when that thing begins, when the Antichrist makes the covenant with Israel, 220 days later, Daniel chapter number 8, 220 days after the Antichrist signs that covenant, the temple is going to be rebuilt and they're going to reinstitute sacrifices in the temple and the Holy of Holies over there. And for 2,300 days, that thing's going to go on. And Jesus Christ says, when you see that thing rebuilt over there, when you see that system I've cursed, when you see them put back into that thing over there and you get that, that mosaic religion going again, and don't you tell me they aren't going to do it, that book says they are. He said, you see that? You can just count the days, buddy, because you're going to see that. Now somebody says, well, they're going to build a temple. No, 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 no. It ain't got anything to do with you. And it ain't got anything to do with that. You see how that passage is misunderstood and twisted? And all you had to do was study what... You didn't have to know anything about rightly dividing the Word. All you had to do was study what the passage was in the prophetic program. And it would have straightened you out. But you see, nobody does that. And the reason they don't do that is because they got the, of the confusion in the minds of people because they weren't rightly dividing. They're back here trying to fit this stuff and work this stuff, and it just will not be accomplished. There's something for you in all this. People, you and I need to take the truth of the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and spread it far and wide. Because there are people out there who will believe what you believe if you'll tell them that need to know about it as much as you needed to know about it before you heard about it. And they need somebody to do for you, for them, what somebody did for you. Get it out to them. And God help us. I tell you folks, when the Lord comes at the rapture, He's going to have to snatch some of you people till you're bald-headed to get you out off this ground, to get you up there. you got your roots so sunk in so hard, He's going to have to just... <laughs> Pull that again and get him up like plucking carrots in hard ground. You need to hold a real loose grip on this world. You know that? You're like a guy living in a house with a fire in the basement. This thing ain't going to last. And you're not down here. God didn't put you here. God didn't leave you here as a member of the body of Christ so you could live a nice, sweet, fat, safe, 
Christian life. You say, you don't understand, but i got to save for retirement. i tell you what. I'm not, I think a man ought, ought not to be, Romans 12 says, not to be slothful in business, and I don't think you ought to be slothful in business. I think you ought to be thoughtful and, 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 and uh, smart and that kind of stuff. But I tell you what, some of you folks act like you, you need to live like kings. And you wouldn't anymore think of sacrificing one pleasure in your life for the cause of Christ than you would of jumping off a, a building ten stories high. If it's convenient, you do it. If it's convenient, you give a track. Maybe if you got one, can find one. But since they cost, and they aren't free at the church, you probably don't have any. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know something, folks? You and I need to get serious about what we're doing. I'm not mad at you. I'm just telling you the truth. One day Jesus Christ is going to come. You, you're going to be like the guy I heard about. He's walking down the street, and he goes... Well, you're going to blow it. <laughs> you're not going to be real happy with the, what, what you're caught doing. Or more important, not doing. You understand that? We live with the wonderful, blessed opportunity of living sacrificially day in and day out for God's glory. He gives you the privilege of being responsible to live every day, every moment, as though it were your last. With the hope and the expectation that He could be here any moment. And my friend, that wonderful, blessed, happy, joy-filled hope is ours. And all the confusion of all this other stuff, you don't need to look around you for all these signs and things. You know what? I don't have to look around me and say, Whoo, look at that! The Lord must be coming soon! I look in His book. And it tells me He might be coming soon. And I put my confidence in that. If the Lord came tonight, would you go to be with Him or would you be left here? This is not going to be a partial rapture. You know what the Bible says about Jesus Christ? He was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. God Almighty knows who all His children are. He knows every member of His family by name, and He's not going to leave a one of them here. He's going to take them all out. And He's going to declare publicly before the universe, you're His child. You're His son. He's going to take you. That's when the adoption... To the adoption to wit, the redemption of the body. You know, when you get your, you got the spirit of adoption now. You've got God, the Holy Spirit, that's going to resurrect your body. He's the spirit that lets you cry, Abba, Father. He's the spirit that gives you the ability to live up to your position. But you're going to get the position. The adoption is when God takes you, the redemption of your body, when He takes you up there and puts you in publicly, displays you to be His full grown son. Boy, what a day that's going to be. When that takes place, he ain't going to have any misfires. He's going to know who his are, and they're going to go. And if you're not, I might think you were. Won't make any difference what I think. Nope. It's what he knows. Do you know for sure tonight that you have eternal life as a present possession? Because you've trusted what God did for you at Calvary and nothing else, and you've by the, the, the personal choice of your own individual faith rested your case in Him and relied exclusively upon Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you have, God saved you. That ends. Maybe you've done what the, you walked an aisle, shook a preacher's hand, did what the preacher said, was baptized, been a member of a church, done this, done that, done the next thing. Maybe you haven't done any of that. You just think you're going to get, get, get by on your own good looks and your grace. You can trust Him tonight and God will save you. And if you, 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 you have, do you have eternal If you have eternal life as a present possession, would you remember 
that the eternal life that God gave you doesn't begin here. It began the moment you trusted Him. You've got it right now. You don't have to wait till out there and let that be what lives in you. Our Father, we thank You tonight for Your goodness, for Your grace. We pray that we might have an understanding of what it is the prophetic program is all about so that we might understand and be, be equipped not to be taken in by the sensationalism and the attempts of, of, of even well-meaning people to, to, to draw us into an excitement about something that really isn't what you're doing. Well, God, may we be able to stand with our feet firmly fixed on the solid rock of the Word of God rightly divided. And having done that, diligently, rightly dividing Your Word. May we, may we know in our experience that Your Word never fails, but that it accomplishes that Word until You've sent it, and that it will work in us for the honor and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.